Hi, Jackie. Hi, Bob. How you doing? Uh, pretty, pretty good. Good. C can you think of a better way to begin your Fourth of July weekend than to tape an episode of Blogging Heads TV? I, I really can't. This Jackie, is, that's a lie. Exactly isn't where it? I, this is exactly where I went. I, no, I'm that's not true, is it? I'm trying not to think about the fact that today was to have been the day that we closed on the sale of our house on Charlton Street. But other than that, that our house is still on the market for reasons we won't go into now, uh, you know, it's a good day. The real estate market has, has not been entirely kind to you, has it? No, not this month. No, no, no. But not. you're but you're painting you're, you're you're painting the house. You're spending some time painting the interior of the well, house. Well, you know, we're we have, we have we're 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 doing all the things we need to do to make our house look pristine and beautiful and to uh, make someone want to buy that, it. That's right good because you know when you have to advertise it as a fixer upper. That's bad. that's just not a selling point. Or I've never I've never is. been attracted or handyman special. Yeah, we don't we don't want that. No, it's Those not. Are bad it's words. not. It's not. Our house is 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 really beautiful. It's centrally located in downtown Princeton. It's an old Victorian. It's lovely, full of charm and. So and any of, viewers who are looking for a house that fits exactly that description, yeah, should that's right. Email you, please. Okay. Yeah. I'd okay. hire somebody to handle the email if I were you. Yeah. Well, uh, you want to talk about world events? Let's talk about world events. Okay. Um, Iran has not seemed all that front burner lately, but there was this uh, seemingly disturbing uh, note about the uh, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, right. who is, uh, has much more actual power than the famously eccentric uh, President Ahmadinejad, who said, and this is reading from a Voice of America uh, Bulletin, Iran's Supreme Leader says he sees no benefit to negotiations with the United States on his country's nuclear program. Th this after we had presented a package that we were very proud of for its magnanimity. I mean, at least the Bush administration was. So, ostensibly, right. this would be a little disappointing. Well, what are, what are insiders such as yourself thinking? Uh, well, a couple things. The, the, there's a lot of background noise while we're all waiting for Iran to formally and officially respond to Javier Solana, the European Union's uh, foreign policy chief. So, you know, in the meantime, we have to we have to kind of wade through all of these statements by senior and not so senior Iranian officials saying we don't want to negotiate with the United States, we like our enrichment program just fine, thank you very much. And and it's a little hard to kind of sit on our hands and and, and wait for Iran's official response, but that's what we have to do, and that's coming in maybe a week, uh, we hope. Um, but the other thing is. Uh, you know, we there was there, there there's this giant build-up to this proposal that was transmitted to Iran by the European Union, and and you just said something about it being very generous and the United States being very proud of it, and and that's certainly true that the U.S. is very proud of it, but but and and, and but we haven't we haven't seen the official copy of the of the proposal. We've only seen a, an unofficial, I think, an early draft version of it, but uh, I think. You know, some people picking it apart are starting to to realize that maybe it does leave something to be desired by Iran. What, what is it? What does it leave? It it, it, it the, the, the proposal's got got some carrots in it. It, it has some. It has lots of good things that that uh, smart people say Iran shouldn't refuse, like a five-year guaranteed fuel supply. Um, access to advanced reactor technology if Iran chooses to build more reactors, which it feels it needs, and uh, promises of more discussions about creating a framework for economic uh, development, uh, increased trade, things like that. Um, that that I, I, Iranians look at that and say, we're supposed to give up this this you know giant technological achievement, which by the way they're making way too much of. Actually, if you scratch the surface of what they've done at Natanz, it turns out to be you know interesting, but maybe not so not so uh, not so huge an accomplishment. Their centrifuges really have 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 not necessarily performed as well as as, as maybe they would have hoped they 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 performed. Anyway, they so, made so this now is it looking like they're more like. Uh you're, you're several years away at a minimum, or from having an actual bomb. Yeah, they're 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 not they're not close to making a bomb if they're relying on uranium that they're producing at Natanz. Okay. But uh, nevertheless, they've made this giant deal out of out of out of out of what they've done there, and 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 in, and and for giving that up, I think they really want something tangible and concrete that plays well in Tehran. That that an average Iranian can say, "Yep, you know, we're not we're not enriching uranium anymore in, 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 at Natanz, but but look, here's what we've got." And I think the best 
thing that this proposal offers them in terms of immediate gratification, which is, after all, what ordinary people on the street look to, are things like uh, spare parts for their, uh, for their aircraft. They have 10 Boeings, and they have, a, I think I read, 17 Airbus, and their Boeings have, haven't, they, they haven't been able to legally acquire spare parts for these planes for a very long time, since 1980 or so. And there's something about the phrase spare parts that just doesn't sound like a major bonanza, you know? It doesn't sound like a major, it do, it's not, it's not a major carrot. And, and I, I just think, I, I'm a little surprised that more, a little more creative thought wasn't given to how we can really make this offer compelling and, and, and sort of, in a way that the average Iranian can say, yeah, it makes no sense for us to have this enrichment program at all. Um, I think you know, a much better plan would be for us to get uh, assistance for our uh, public health or, mm -hmm. you know, our, uh, you know, our it, it, it advanced technology in some other area. Well, there was this uh, op-ed piece in the New York Times by Flint Leverett, who I think worked in the Bush administration in the early years, right? Yeah, it was on the NSC staff. Uh, and... Uh, he was saying that, I mean, he was saying that, that what we need is a grand bargain. I mean, he said either in this piece or in a talk that I heard him give recently that basically he thought this overture was not nearly what it's made out to be. It wasn't, wasn't, wasn't even all that deeply earnest as a diplomatic overture, and it was more an attempt to head off embarrassment in the Security Council with... with, with uh, with, with, you know, people like China and Russia and conceivably even the Europeans deserting us. Um, and it was just kind of a short-term fix to, to head that off. Um, and he was proposing uh, something including security guarantee, well, full normalization of right. relations, I guess, and security guarantees, which means, in other words, we promise you we will not attack you. And he seemed to think that's what it would take and that it would be worth it. Uh, I'm not sure I see the Bush administration ever telling just about anyone that we won't attack them. I mean, certainly members of the axis of evil w would have to work hard to get that, I would think. Um, right. But My favorite that... phrase in his op-ed was that the offer was strategically shallow. Yeah. And I think that that, that is an accurate summation of, of, of our position. The, I mean, the other side of the equation, aside from what, I, I mean, I, I think any diplomat would agree that you've got to give the Iranian leaders something that, at a minimum, lets them save face, turn to their people and say, see, this is a victory. And there's two ways, two sides of that story, and, and you probably need to play them both. One is, what do we give them? And the other is, what do they get to keep in terms of processing capability, right? I mean... What, right. what they, the one thing they've said so many times that it's going to be hard for them to back off of, they've said it in public so many times, right. is, you know, well, correct me if I've got the details wrong, but we have the right to, you know, process this stuff for our energy. I guess they've said, use the phrase, enrich uranium for domestic energy use, right? For, for a peaceful nuclear program. And so, well, you know, it seems to me it's going to be hard to get them to back off of that uh, as a practical matter. And one question is, is it possible to arrange inspections that are strong enough that we could be sure that that's in fact all they were doing, that, that they could be enriching uranium and we could be sure that they weren't turning it into weapons? Is that technically feasible? The, the answer is no. It's not the, at all. You can, you can arrange all the inspections you want and you can make them great and you can, you can put cameras in 24-7 and, and no notice inspections and all of that. The point that, that gets nonproliferation experts really concerned about is that is that any country that has the full fuel cycle, but in particular the enrichment part of the fuel cycle, is, is another country too many. And the expertise, the, 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 the capability that you gain from operating a centrifuge cascade can be replicated someplace else out of, out of your uh, monitoring camera's site. Uh, you can, um, a rogue a member of the uh, regime could, could sell or give away that technology to someone else. And, and from and, you know, an environmental and um, economic point of view, you know, there's this enormous investment of resources in something that is really giving you a very small margin of return that you'd be far better off acquiring uh, on, on, on the market in some other way. So there are all kinds of good reasons why the enrichment part of the fuel cycle in particular is, is, is not a good thing for Iran. Okay, now as far as them doing it somewhere else secretly, you can imagine... Uh, inspections intrusive enough, right? I mean, if, if you said inspectors can go look anywhere, and, and uh, you can imagine making it very hard for them to do it, but under existing I inspection 
uh, protocol, you wouldn't you, you would you would have too much uncertainty or. I mean, existing, can you dream up existing, a dream inspection regime if you, if you just leave aside the really, question of how much of, of Iran's sovereignty you wanted to preserve? Um, centrifuge cascades are, are really easy to hide. You can put them, you know, they, 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 they need a large power source, but other than that, they can be anywhere. We still have no idea where North Korea's uh, uranium enrichment program is located. Um, it's it's uh, under existing inspection protocols. The IEA can, if, if Iran re-adheres to the additional protocol, the IEA can go almost anywhere it wants with some very minimal notice. Um, but that's not, but, but, that's, but I don't think that's going to make people who worry about enrichment, proliferation, sleep easier at night. I think that, I think that the, the idea is that what we have to try to do is, is persuade Iran that it's not in its or the world's interest for more countries to have enrichment capabilities, that what we need to be moving to is a situation where there, uh, Iran has a stake in and in, has a management, a financial, even a technical stake in an enrichment program somewhere else mm -hmm. that lots of countries can, can but, subscribe to. But can. there is something, right, that we are going to let them, in principle, under this agreement, we would let them do domestically after a period during which right and what is that so that's not enriching uranium what is well, it we there, would be there, the to language the language of the proposal i wish i had it in front of me but it, the, 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 but it you know basically it, it's sort of there were a couple of paragraphs that set up some giant hurdles that iran would have to to jump over that basically the, we the, the security council and the iea board of governors would have to be completely 100% satisfied that iran was entirely with no doubt whatsoever abiding by every last inch of of its obligations under under the NPT and you know that you know any tiny little uncertainty the US would would use as a, as a reason not to implement that um, provision which would allow Iran someday in the future to have have its own so, so you think program. they would be right to mistrust that yeah, that that's kind of yeah. I don't think I don't think anyone reading that would say, oh, we get to have enrichment. We just have to do we wait a little while, and and you know, it's not it's not it's not going to be as easy to that as easy as that. Well, as well, if indeed then it's not plausible that we're going to let them save face in the sense of getting to right. do what they have repeatedly said is imperative, which is right. enrich uranium on their right. soil. Um, then it seems to me the carrots are going to have to be pretty big. I mean, carrots are going to have, have to be, be pretty big. To, Turn to their people and say, "Look, okay, we changed our mind. We backed off on this one thing, but look what we got." Exactly, which is which is why I, it's, I think it's a little dismaying for people who who care, who want Iran to kind of make the logical choice to give up enrichment, which is a logical choice. It doesn't make sense for Iran to have its own enrichment capability. Uh, that you then have to you put something real on the table: an aircraft spare parts, a framework for you know trade development. It, it, that seems a little um, underwhelming, and certainly it's going to play that way in, in, in Tehran. Mm -hmm. So, in sum, I mean, we can move on, but the, the second paragraph of this Voice of America thing, where it adds that the Ayatollah said Iran is willing to discuss international supervision of its program if other countries accept Iran's right to a nuclear program, that ultimately, in your view, is not helpful i mean i mean it's not harmful it's just it's just that th this is not a loophole that ultimately is going to be successfully exploited because you think that's a dead end i i, I the, the the only way maybe things will muddle forward will, will be for iran to accept another suspension like a, a, with a, a 6 to, to to 12 months or something a set period of time and in that time the EU with the U.S. at the table and maybe Russia and China can all sit down with Iran and, and, and try to negotiate some, some real tangible benefits that can be translated into things that, you know, pe the people of Iran will see mm -hmm. um, uh, make sense for, for them to give up this, this, this enrichment capability in favor of, you know, something, something else much better. Because there are a lot better things that it, Iran could put its money in than, you know, Natanz, 164 centrifuges that maybe aren't even working all that well. Um, you know, it, 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 it seems to me a, a, a logical choice, but, you know, I think that that needs to be made much more clear than, than, than the Bush administration has made it. Because, you know, the, the, the focus of the Bush administration is on punitive measures. It's, it's if there's anything less than full acceptance of this offer, then, you know, we go back to the Security Council to get a, a, a Chapter 7 resolution, and that, that's also kind of a dead end. Now, Bush's instinct is all sticks and no carrots. I remember years ago, 
well, a year or two ago on Iran, maybe a year ago or even less, he said, we've sanctioned ourselves out of influence. In other words, we had already applied the sticks, the sanctions, and so there's kind of nothing else to do. Well, actually, there, there is a whole other realm of things you can do. They're called carrots, things, you know. Right. But, but he just doesn't think that way. He thinks when you've exhausted the sticks at your disposal, there's just kind of no point in talking. I mean, that, right. that really is his instinct. He's an all sticks, no carrots guy, even though he's been, you know, forced, you know, by, by, by re grim reality and Condi Rice and whoever else to throw in a few carrots at this point. Exactly. Um, okay, moving on to, to something... Uh, no more encouraging uh, Israel and the Palestinians. Um, of course, we, there's a chance it will be overtaken by events. But as of now, you know, there was this, uh, this soldier who, who, was, uh, who was kidnapped by the Palestinians. A couple of soldiers were killed. Um, Israel basically kind of invaded, I guess, southern Gaza, knocked out this power plant, um, blew up some bridges, uh, and uh, now they're now, and that's kind of where the state of play is largely. There's a lot of discussion about what happens next, and I actually think I may have just seen a report that Israel has Israel moved further north in Gaza, or have you heard anything about that? No, I mean, no, I, no. I was just thinking about um, the the one report I read this morning was about the the UN humanitarian chief. Uh, talking about conditions in Gaza deteriorating, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not excellent. sure about yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, it's uh, it's kind of a mess, and I'm not sure. Well, the other thing Israel has done is is uh, is, is seize uh, a good chunk of the Palestinian government. That is to say, a lot of members of Hamas, who I think like a third of the cabinet. And uh, I don't know, maybe 20 members of parliament or something, and they are holding them, I guess, in jail. I guess they uh, they've been formally arrested or something. And the question, I mean, I mean, I didn't see the logic of knocking out that power plant at all. No. That seems to me it seems superficially to a lot of people, certainly people of a European cast of mind, uh, disproportionate. To, uh, given the fact that it, it, it disrupts power for, I think, a long time for hundreds of thousands of Palestinians, as for the capture of the, uh, as for the capture of the of the, the the members of government, the question is: Do they plan to use them as bargaining chips, or do they just plan to, uh, you know, keep them in jail and hope that that will derail Hamas's, uh, you know? path to power and influence uh, in Palestine. I mean, it's a little of a mystery. I mean, they're denying that they're going to use them as bargaining chips. But if they're not, I don't really see how any of this gets them closer to actually getting the soldier back. But, of course, the question then is, is that really the main thing on their minds? There are definitely other things on their agenda, wiping out the infrastructure for creating these uh, Kassan rockets, for example, and, you know, influencing the political equation in Palestine, and in their mind, I, th I think, uh, you know, capturing a bunch of members of Hamas who are in government is a way of doing that. I don't know. What's your take? Well, I, you know, I think it's going to be, I think this, this is one of the first test cases where, you know, Israel has, has uh, it, I mean, it, it, it looks to me, you know, as someone who, you know, follows the news on this subject, but not as closely as you do, perhaps, that Israel's kind of throwing it all out on the line right now, seizing the government, bombing the power plant, um, 1.5 million residents of Gaza. Uh, this power plant provided um, uh, power for you know, almost half of the population. That's uh, that's a huge uh, amount of, uh, of of collateral, you know, damage potentially. Uh, Jan Eglin's talking about you know, a real humanitarian crisis within a matter of days if, if power isn't restored. Um, and, well, and they can't easily restore power, right? I mean, I heard it was going to take months to repair. I mean, this is the primary and maybe you know power generating station in all of Gaza, and I had heard it was going to take months to repair. Yeah, and, and the rest of the, the power that isn't locally generated comes from Israel, so who knows whether they would uh, increase the, their, you well, know. Well, if they can do that, I suspect they will be doing it before long. Right, right. Anyway, so, yeah, I mean, I think what's going to be interesting is, is whether this is going to, could this possibly work? It, it, I mean, could it, could it, could it possibly result in the, in the return of this, of this young man, this 19-year-old, alive? 
and uh, you know what, what 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 is the price? I I, I mean I, I really I, I don't know. I, it just it just it seems like Israel has so quickly rapidly escalated the stakes of this confrontation to a point where it will be very hard to imagine a a but I, I mean I'm hoping but I very hard to imagine a a happy a happy resolution. Yeah, well, I mean, there's two things you hear about the Israeli motivation. One is political. People point out that neither um, Olmert uh, nor uh, the defense minister, Peretz, has the kind of military experience that traditionally Israeli leaders have had. And so they don't, they don't have this storied career that, say, Sharon had, and so they, don't have, they need to work harder to establish, to show their manhood, basically. That's one thing you're hearing a, lo a lot of, and, and that's just a political calculation. In terms of how this might actually lead to getting this guy released, you also hear that, uh, that conceivably Egypt and or Syria, but Egypt's the one doing the talking now, could apply enough pressure on Hamas to get him released and maybe creating this huge crisis as a way to get Egypt's attention or something. I don't know. I think certainly part of the explanation has to be that there were other things on the Israeli agenda, uh, getting to these, uh, the infrastructure for these Qassam rockets, although I think they're not yet in the part of Gaza that would permit them to do that. I think that's northern Gaza, so that would have to lie ahead. And just, you know, their thinking all along, you know, has not been that the, the, the members of the, the Hamas members of the, of the uh, Palestinian government can be moderated. Their thinking all along has been, uh, you know, ultimately we need some kind of showdown between them and Fatah, even a civil war. You just need to basically eliminate Hamas. And, and, and you know, putting a bunch of them in jail is one way to get them, get them on the stage. I think it's, it's just not from Israel's point of view uh, that that's not going to be productive, which is not to say that this whole thing is going to have been productive from uh, from the Palestinians' point of view, um, it's... Well, I suppose the one thing Israel could do if it wanted to, to ratchet this down a notch it would be to release some, some Palestinian prisoners. Yeah, but, geez, they, they, they sound like they're a long way from doing that. I mean, that's the yeah. thing. Anything short of that, I don't see how it gets their soldier released. Hamas, it is just not a face-saving resolution for Hamas, even if Israel gives back all these guys they just captured, it is not a face-saving solution for Hamas to say, okay, here's the guy. I mean, the, Hamas has to get something for this, and I don't think Israel's going to give it, arguably for good reasons. I don't, I don't think it's, it's necessarily a good idea to bargain for hostages. Um, so uh, I, it's not that easy to see. Uh, the, the other thing here is, look, Israel is stalling and using intelligence to find out where this guy is. And it could be that if you find out where he is and surround him and give the Palestinians inside literally the choice between living and dying, it kind of depends on who they are, you know. It's not always easy to choose to die. And, uh, and, and, and maybe that would lead uh, to his release. But it seems to me like this is a major mess. And, and, and it's very hard to imagine, you know, things not being a lot worse than they were before the guy was kidnapped in the first place. I mean, this just seems to me uh, it's going to be going to turn out badly. And, and I have to, I mean, this is a hobby horse of mine, that, that it was a mistake to immediately cut off the funding uh, of Hamas, uh, just, you know, because Hamas did not recognize Israel's right to exist. There's no way Hamas was going to do that 180 right away. I mean, that was either naive or cynical to demand that of them. I would, I would love to know what would have happened if what you had said to Hamas is this. Look, you're in charge now. We expect the following. A, you continue your ceasefire. B, now that you're in charge, you rein in the terrorists on the margin who are still launching rockets and things, which would have been basically Islamic Jihad, I, say, I think. And if Hamas had managed to, to reconcile with Fatah, had managed to, to create a working relationship, I think they would have had the power to rein in those terrorists. That at least is a credible demand, a demand that could possibly be met, because it doesn't involve Hamas immediately and conspicuously throwing overboard, you know, years and years of core ideological doctrine. And in any event, I think certainly cutting off the funding immediately, you know, has not been vindicated by the subsequent train of events, because that was actually the cause 
uh, or, uh, of, of Hamas ending the ceasefire, even though the pretext was the explosion of the shell on the beach. I mean, ultimately, it was, in, it was a basically a delayed reaction to Israel playing hardball on the funding, I think, and Europe and the United States playing hardball on the funding. Right, right. No, I mean, I, I, I have, I, who knows, you know, maybe, maybe later today we'll learn that, that he's been released or found or something, but this just, just, it's, it's just been a shocking escalation of, of tension. Yeah, and I mean, you know, he's, uh, he, it's a very poignant picture of him that's being circulated, you know, he right, looks like right. a, looks like a kid. Yep, he um, is a kid. And, and uh, so, uh, yeah. That's that. We so we have no productive insights, in short, into what they could do going forward. And I just reiterate my complaints as to what they didn't do in the first place. So, uh, well, you know, in keeping with a happy talk here, I think we should go to North Korea. That's a happy place to live. Yeah. <laughs> and they're sure. trying to make life happy for all of us. Um, there's this thing. They're they're saying now that they're gonna they're gonna um launch this missile that I guess is what, has a right. longer range than previous missiles that they've tested? Yes, yes. Like, I mean, like, a part of me wonders, could this thing just be, like, the Potemkin missile? Is this the... Anyway, yes, okay. So the missile is apparently three stages, you know. Each stage is a rocket in, in itself uh, with its own engine and fuel source, and the idea is that uh, the rocket lifts off and then the stages successively drop away, until you are left with the final stage and it continues its trajectory and uh, lands, the, 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 the fear is, uh, could land, uh, could, 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 the, the missile could um, have, a, have a range far enough to reach the United States, although my favorite uh, blogger, um, Jeffrey Lewis at Arms Control Wonk, points out that, that uh, the Earth is round and if it flies over the Sea of Japan, there, it wouldn't, reach Alaska or uh, anyway I, I, I recommend uh, that he has he has a nice blog post on, on how so wait he's saying what that it that uh... he's saying that there's that there's very little risk that of, 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 of this missile reaching anywhere near United States territory but, but, could, but could it does it have the capability if it if, if, if it, it if it were pointed in the right direction or if it flew if it flew in the, in the in the right direction but if it if it flies the way they've tested their previous missiles it would not. And, and it, well, is part of our fear that if they test it, they'll better know how to use it, and then someday they could use it to lob at the United States with a new right. bomb? Is that part of our... Part of our fear? Yeah. Um, yes, it seems to be a wildly remote possibility. I, I mean, the last time North Korea launched a missile was 1998, and everyone was surprised by this. It, had, it, had a, it was a failed satellite launch. The, 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 the missile crashed down somewhere in the Pacific, although North Korea claimed later that it was up in space and broadcasting revolutionary slogans back to Earth, which I think is, is kind of cute. Um, that, <laughs> uh, so so, they, so they, they, they tried to launch a, a missile eight, eight years ago, and, um, and of course, in the, in the intervening time, we've been trying to build up our own missile defense capability. And in the, I think since 1999, the United States has sent up 10 missiles of its own to be intercepted. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've successfully intercepted five of them. The most recent intercept, successful intercept was in October of 2002, I believe. So, you know, we, we've been, we have this, you know, really mixed record of success at our own, you know, missile defense. We have these interceptors in uh, uh, Fort Greeley, Alaska, and in, in a, a couple in California. And uh, now word comes that uh, North Korea has a missile on the launch pad, and it's been fueled, although, you know, people have walked that back in, in recent days. It's not clear now uh, that uh, this missile is in any in, in any shape to go anywhere. I mean, we don't. We, the, the truth is, we just don't know. We just have so little intelligence about about this kind of thing that there's all. All we really know is what we can see from the air, from the sky, and uh, it it looked at, at the time a couple of weeks ago that that the missile was in the final stages of being fueled, but but now. Uh, you know, we don't know what's happening. Well, presumably, boosters of the missile defense program are going to use this as a talking point, right? Yeah, they're sure. going to say, "See, we've got to put more money into 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 right. missile defense." Put more money in missile defense, and 
try to make our interceptors work. But uh, I, 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 I mean, in a way, what would be kind of interesting, I think, is if North Korea did attempt to launch the missile and it failed again. Yeah. And, and what would that what would that mean? I mean, I, I think one of the more interesting op-eds to come out of this debate in the last two weeks is is one by um, Bill Perry, former Secretary of Defense Perry. And Ash yeah, that Carter. was wild. That was wild. That was. Now, that, that was the, 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 here's a he was a Clintonite. He was a member. He, he was Secretary of Defense under Clinton, right? Right. And, and I didn't read the piece. I just read accounts of it. But he's coming yeah. out and saying, you know, let's bomb North Korea, basically. Shoot the, yes, bomb the missile on the launch pad. I, I mean, how often does Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld get an opportunity to say, oh no, <laughs> that's a little too, that's a little, that's well, a little too yeah. hawkish for us. Yeah, so, give peace a chance. It, yeah, it's good, it, right. Uh, yeah, yeah, Rumsfeld doesn't say that every day. But, but you know, I, I mean, I will say that even a full-scale invasion of North Korea, in my mind, is infinitely preferable to invading Iraq. And, I mean, I actually felt that way before the Iraq War. I think Evo Dalder of the Brookings Institute was, was before the Iraq War kind of saying, you know, I mean, he was very much against the Iraq War, I think, but he was saying, now, North Korea, you know, relatively, you know, the, and, and you have to admit that on all counts, that would have been a better idea. A, they actually had nukes, and, and, you know, and yet it was in a stage where we could probably get to them and get regime change before they used them. B, the war itself would have been so much simpler. And I mean, it's true that they have these, this artillery or whatever amassed at the border, and you could have killed some South Koreans. That would have been bad. But, I mean, once... Once you, you know, end the, like, what would have been like a five-day war or something, I think. I don't know about five-day war. Well, whatever. I, I'll tell you, I think, I mean, in general, these Stalinist, communist regimes, when push comes to shove. They shove. They, their, their technology turns out to be laughably bad. If you remember right. when America went against Soviet technology in the Persian Gulf War, it was like a video game. It was, I mean... It's true that we have built up North Korea. North Korea is our, like, last Cold War enemy, and, and, and you know... The fear that grips, you know, uh, people talking about uh, North Korean launch towards Seoul and, you know, we have to push it back, it would take us 30 days and a million man army, you know, you do think that, you, you know, that, that, that there, you know, I, I, there, there is this huge, you know, concern that, that, that grips people about, about that. I really think if we planned a war, I mean, I'm not necessarily <laughs> advocating it, but I think if we, if we planned a war, we would take we could take out the threatening aspects uh, well i i think it would be over sooner than people think in any event once you won it would just be you would just hand it to south korea and say you know do you need some money i mean it would be just no, nothing we, like it's the like massive of Iraq. massive cult deprogramming necessary we'd have to get all the people who are um, working on deprogramming ex scientologists they'd all have to come over to south korea to work on the the uh, the, the North Koreans. There was a really interesting article about uh, a, a South Korean um, kind of camp for helping North Korean defectors adjust to life in the real world, mm -hmm. and it's fascinating how much work it, you know, it takes to kind of get these former North Koreans, um, you know, able to kind of look at the world in a, in a totally different way. Huh. So we would have to do some deprogramming. Would there be some deprogramming? But but I, I, I don't think we should be glib about what war in the Korean Peninsula would no, be No, I like. don't. I just, I mean, I'm mainly saying that actually if you had to start a war to, you know, on grounds, on anti-terrorism grounds four years, three years ago, I really think that was the one to start. They actually had nukes. Nukes can get into the hands of terrorists, and the war would have been a much simpler thing. But... But that, that's the only yeah, point. Yeah, that's, 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 that's hindsight. But, and, I, and I think, actually, five years ago, no one would have thought that. No, no Evo one... Dalder was, I think Evo Dalder was saying something like this right before the Iraq War. I wasn't, but somebody was, I think. Right. Anyway, if I, if I have the, uh, the initiative and in industry to actually dig up any such Evo Dalder piece and I find it, I will, I will post it. I mean, well, Perry, Perry thinks that there's no, there's very little chance, Perry and Ash Carter think that there's very little chance North Korea would respond militarily to an attack of its uh, missile launch site um, because 
Kim Jong Il would know that that's the end of his regime. If he starts and, a war, yeah. Yeah. And it would and be. It would be. It would be the end. But um, I, that, that, that's 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 still a, that's still a leap. That 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 assumption. And and I certainly South Korea has no uh, no interest at all in the United States practicing a little regime change in North Korea. Yeah. Well, I mean, in any event, the the my feeling about North Korea's nukes is. Launching long-range missiles is the least of the problems. And, I mean, this is why, you know, even before 9-11, I, I was not a, a big fan of missile defense. I mean, you know, a lot of us were saying, look, the, the great threat we face is terrorists sneaking nukes in, not nukes coming in on a missile. I'm sure you were saying the same thing. Lots of us were. It was, so it was, of course, very frustrating. After 9-11, the neocons, who had been saying exactly the opposite, you know, that, it, that, that, that missile defense is imperative and all of these... All of these rogue states could launch a strike as soon as they get the capability. That they all of a sudden claimed vindication and said, "Yeah, right, terrorism's the problem." So, let's still do everything we were recommending before, even though our premises were completely different then. Right. And well, don't, well, don't forget. You know, we've never actually seen a North Korean nuclear weapon. But you think they do we're, have? We're one, taking right? their word. We're, we're taking their word that they that they've weaponized their plutonium. You know, and you think it may not be true. I don't know. I mean, I mean, maybe they have weaponized it, but what if their weapons don't work? You know, what if their what if their you know implosion design doesn't doesn't work? I, I don't know. I, look, I'm assuming it works, hmm. but I just think it's it's uh, there's just so much we don't know about North Korea that that when you build foreign policy on a, on a series of assumptions, you kind of get to a place very quickly yeah. that it turns out you you maybe shouldn't have gone. You know, it's same same thing with Iraq. Although in the case of Iraq, we had the information we needed beforehand to know. That if there were any WMD in Iraq, it was you know few and far between, not not much left to find. Mm -hmm. We just chose to ignore that information. Um, in the in the case of North Korea, you know, there's just vast amounts we we don't know. So to base a whole foreign policy on on, on worst case scenarios, um, I don't know. If it's the smartest thing to do in this so, case. So this missile is called a Typo Dong or something. Typo Dong. And do, do their missiles always? Do their names always end with a syllable Dong? I know. I mean, is that some kind of mantra? You think posturing? someone might have like whispered into their ear, you know, maybe you should change the name of your missile. No, I thought the opposite. I thought it was this. <laughs> it was like macho posturing, you know. I guess so, but like, how embarrassing! Well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't it know. It shuts me up a little. I'll tell you. Yeah. And I yeah. think that's what they're after. Yeah, maybe. Head games. Head games. Um, they, yeah. Well, I guess on that note, now that we've turned North Korea into a laughing matter. <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, we were gonna. You brought up this question of whether um, whether the, the well, I don't know if you meant the Iraq War itself or Bush's foreign policy in general. Uh, the war on terror, how we've executed the war on terror. Yeah, whether this is, amounts to the worst foreign policy blunder uh, since ancient Greece or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Well, you know, I guess you know, you know, I I feel deluged now in in stories about how we've really been executing the war on terror in Guantanamo and in other places and and the, you know the resort to the use of torture NPR has had this great series all week on on torture they've interviewed torturers and victims of torture by US hands and and you know I you know really wow this is where we are now you know 5 years after September 11, you know, we are a country that systematically rounds up some often innocent people, tortures them, gets useless information for the for for uh, for the torture, uh, acts on it, um, kills more possibly innocent people, uh, alienates vast um, populations across uh, important parts of the world, and this is where we are now. It's it's just it's almost breathtaking how far we've come from from I think where um, we thought smart people leading us would take us. Um, yeah, and of course yesterday the Supreme Court uh, said that our, our our mo is not is not acceptable. That that uh, these Guantanamo guys are going to have to uh, we're either going to have to go through Congress. Bush, the Bush administration is either going to have to go through Congress to get it to validate some novel judicial procedure, or we're going to have to to, to employ already accepted procedures, such as court court martial. Exactly. These these mili this whole military tribunal thing that we kind of concocted is is not acceptable. Right. Um. 
Yeah, it, it's uh, – and I don't know, I missed the NPR series. I mean, I guess, the, the, I guess now we do have a lot of specific information about what we've been doing. And is it – is it more that we've been doing the torturing or that we've been outsourcing it? Well, it, no. It looks like we've been doing a lot of it ourselves um, and, and outsourcing it. God knows what the outsourcing terror, uh, torture was like. But, but what's, what's, really, what's really depressing is not only have we, you know, we do this, but we get so little for it. It doesn't work. And, and of course, uh, you know, experts in law enforcement and, and, and other things said in the beginning, look, you know, the information you get through torture, occasionally you get something good and useful. But nine times out of ten, it's garbage. And, um, and not just garbage meaning it doesn't hold up in court, but garbage meaning it, it doesn't lead you to the insurgents. It doesn't lead you to the to the Well, to the and plotters. it may mislead you into deploying like, resources exactly. in, a, in a way which, that's not which useful. In, which in the case of Iraq, it absolutely has, time and time again, apparently. Were there, were there big examples of that in the NPR series? Uh, there was, you know, there was some discussion about how, uh, in, in, I think, and also I, talking to Ron Suskin in, in his book that, you know, in, in rounding up people in a neighborhood, um, subjecting them to some, you know, high pressure tactics. Where are the insurgents? Where are they living? They'll say something. They go there, knock down the doors, uh, arrest everyone in sight. You know, yeah. and or how about this? How about you know, the the. Um, Killings of uh, people in Haditha, these, which were I, in retaliation. To yeah, well, leaving. that's a different thing. I mean, that, that's that, 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 that soldier's that, going crazy. Which, but, but, but that's still all. I think a, all it's all really of a piece. Well, it, it looks that way from the Muslim world. Right. Uh, I mean, it's all part of the same talking point. But it, it, it's it something we have less control over. I mean. Right. In this kind of war, that's almost inevitably going to happen. What's new is that it's going to get documented. It's, it's right. harder to conceal than it used to be, I think. I mean, God right. knows how many times things like this happened in, in, uh, in Vietnam. The, right. the Ron, so you've, you've looked at the Ron Suskin book? I haven't, I haven't looked at the Ron Suskin oh, book, see. and I know, it's been, I, know, I know that there's been some criticism of, of I that. have, you know, I just have, have heard some quotes from his work, from his book, that just seem like a little too good right. to be true, a little too perfect. I, 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 don't, I don't think he... I don't think he's like some kind of major fabricator. I, I'm just not. I'm just not, not ready to jump on board. Uh, you know, I, 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 I'm, I should say nothing since I have not investigated the matter. I retract everything I just said. I'm agnostic okay. on Ron Suskind, okay. but, um, but it is in, in terms of this larger question of how, wh what, when this century has foreign policy gone as badly as it seems to have gone, at least. At least to me and you, and, and, and really to a growing number of, of Republicans who, who yeah, well, are... Well, I mean, I think that that is an interesting question. You know, when in the last hundred years or two hundred years? I so mean, Vietnam is a famous blunder, but Vietnam, first of all, one thing that Vietnam didn't do is make people in America less safe than they had been before. And I think, I mean, uh, I have this quote, actually, on this subject. You know, there was this poll done... Well, not directly on this subject, but on, in terms of what the Iraq War has uh, has done for terrorism, uh, there was this this uh, poll done by uh, by Foreign Policy magazine and uh, of, of, of uh, former security officials, and a majority of them said that we were losing the war on terror, which I think is actually kind of a weird way to put the question. That, that, uh, but anyway, one of them said. A former CIA official who described himself as a conservative Republican said the war in Iraq has provided global terrorist groups with a recruiting bonanza, a valuable training ground, and a strategic beachhead at the crossheads of the oil-rich Persian Gulf and Turkey, the traditional land bridge linking the Middle East to Europe. That's a perfect story. I think that, that yeah, no, that is that sums up well what it's done, and 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 it's true that I think the the threat is more immediate to people in that region, including Europeans. But I also think it has just increased the chances that something will happen in America because it's been such a good selling point for terrorist recruiters. Um, and, uh, and Vietnam didn't do that. I mean, in fact, the whole question of whether Vietnam was a problem in terms of the Cold War is kind of an open one. My own view is that the, the Soviet system was just bound to collapse internally. It just was not a sufficiently productive uh, system economically, and it had the, the, the added disadvantage of giving people no freedom. Uh, you know, so I'm not sure that to the extent that Vietnam, the Vietnam experience inhibited us from engaging in <clears throat> further proxy wars, I'm not really sure that that, that that mattered very much. 
But well, well, you know, there's now all this discussion about how maybe not so much Vietnam, but that, but the Watergate period, you know, which uh, eroded the powers of the presidency. This is the uh, this is the point of uh, Jane Mayer's profile of uh, David Addington Cheney's uh, kind of chief advisor lawyer. That, that because we came out of that, that period in the late 60s with the power of the presidency severely eroded, this administration is now trying to undo all that damage. And, and what we see now in the execution of the war on terror, the establishment of these military tribunals, which are now ruled unconstitutional, is an attempt to remedy that. Mm. So we've kind of, you know, in, a, in attempting to, to right a perceived wrong from that Cold War era in the late 60s and early 70s, we've gotten ourselves into this much worse mess. Yeah. And I guess you could argue that maybe the failure in Vietnam was one of the things that made Reagan gun-shy when he pulled out of Lebanon immediately after the bombing of whatever that was. We lost some uh, Marines barracks, or something. Um, that, that is cited. That, that, that apparently, Al-Qaeda apparently considered that significant data and a sign right. that America right. is ultimately weak. That, That's that, true. Uh, so conceivably, you can imagine Vietnam having... Uh, Having influenced that decision, I don't know, but uh, but things well, certainly seem, um, Vietnam hangs over the Pentagon, and, and and I but I think in a sobering good. I mean, it's all of the the majority of senior Pentagon guys now, women not not so much women I guess, but you know, um, you were trained in that era in Vietnam. They kind of came up in that in that era, and they are they're very sober mm -hmm. about deploying forces and very careful about 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 how they want to do it. And that's that's a good thing, right? Well, I mean, that's it is. We in fact, our... they are the people that Bush and Rumsfeld failed to listen to basically before exactly. they invaded Iraq, right? Exactly. Uh, certainly, uh, Shinseki. There's the, there's seven of them, right? I don't know. To varying degrees, have said in, in different ways, uh, not our idea, not how we would have fought the war, um, poor planning, not enough troops, et cetera. Yeah. Um, anyway, so I, I look, you know, Vietnam, it's, it's had a huge impact on, on the conduct of American foreign policy mm -hmm. and military policy. I mean, uh, we should say, uh, amidst this kind of morning session, I mean, M-O-U-R, in addition to M-O-R, um, that... Uh, there is a chance, and it may be the last chance, that right now Iraq could start to turn the corner towards some sort of stability. I mean, you know, Zarqawi got killed, new government finally got its act together, and they have extended this overture to the, uh, to the insurgents that includes at least some form of amnesty. I mean, it, it seems to me that this is... It seems to me it's the last gasp before a much larger havoc... But it is a gasp. I mean, I, I just don't know. I haven't been able to track uh, kind of the, the, the parameters since. I haven't been able to figure out whether there are, there are many auspicious signs since the government extended that overture about a week or so ago. So I don't know. But it seems to me if something good is, if, there, if that's going to turn in a positive direction, it would be the con this concatenation of events that would make it do so. And if this doesn't make it do so, uh, I think things are going to get bleak. Well, I think, you know, we're always going to be able to point to some positive developments in Iraq, right? Even, not only were there overtures made to the insurgents, but there were reports of the insurgents themselves making overtures to, um, to, to, to Sunnis in government. And, and, and maybe there's going to be progress on infrastructure development. You know, the power, electrical power will stay on for longer parts of the day, and, you know, schools will get rebuilt and all of that. Maybe there will be good news on lots of fronts. But... Uh, you know, the, the damage to the United States, I, I mean, I, that's sort of the, the kind of enduring damage in how we've executed the war in, in Iraq and the war on terror elsewhere, war in Afghanistan not going so well. Um, that's, you know, I think a, a, a harder, you know, question to answer. And, you know, certainly I wonder, you know, ten years from now whether we'll just, this will have just been one bleak period. No, I, I think the war will have been a mistake in, in either event. The question is kind of whether it was a minor disaster or a major disaster. I mean, you right. never know for sure with history. Completely unforeseen consequences can materialize. And, and, and the truth is you can never even confidently do the analysis with history. Things are, you, you can never know for sure what would have been. But, but I, I, yeah, no, I, I think the war was, was definitely bad. It's definitely made America less secure. And the question now is just how much less secure it will have made... Uh, America. 
And, and how much less best secure, case, yeah. If yeah. a rock stabilizes fairly soon, it will still have been a bad idea. Don't get me right. wrong. <laughs> it, I mean, can't, isn't there anything positive we can say? I don't know. This has been such a depressing discussion. What, what well, else? wait. I mean, it's the 4th of July. Can we talk about things we like about America? Yes. We didn't plan this, so we don't have anything. I, there's so many things. <laughs> we're, there are. We're, we're 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 the land of the the, the frontier spirit can do up by the bootstraps. That's why you and I have both been so upbeat throughout this conversation. That's, that's right. That's We've right. We're the American spirit. That's right. You know, I mean, I was in I was in Europe with my husband um, not that long ago, and and you are struck by you know you know I, everyone says this is a cliche how old all the buildings are and how kind of defeatist. And kind of fatalistic, you know, pe people are, and and you know, this 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 we're not fatalistic, right? We're, right. We're not, except when talking about the war on terror and how we run it. Yeah. No, I am. I am hope. I mean, there's a lot of great things about America. Uh, you know, it's. I mean, the the sheer ethnic diversity. Yeah. Uh, and especially when you have these moments when people of different ethnicities happen to be gathered, especially if like they don't know each other, but there's some kind of encounter in an elevator or a sidewalk or something, and they all like laugh at the same thing or something. Exactly. You know? Right. That's right. great. I love right. that. Right. I love that. It too. does happen. I do. Um, and you know, in that sense, we're kind of well positioned to lead the world forward, since since the big problem the world is having is getting people from different religions, ethnicities, and so on to live together. I mean, in principle, we, you know, this is my idea. This is as close as I'll come to manifest destiny. This is this should be our mission, is, is to kind of take the, the, the American model and make it global. And that right, would be good. Right, right, right. And, and, and I do think these problems are actually, in principle, soluble. It's just that human nature sometimes gets people to a point where it's very hard to actually settle on a solution. And I, I think... Uh, Israel and, and, and the Palestinians is a good example, where, where if it's easy for us to, to come up with these things that would work, and I think there are things that would work, but if you're on either side of that, it's very hard to kind of think coolly and clearly. I mean, if you're either an Israeli and, and, and bombs have gone off in restaurants and you know people have been killed and these rockets are like landing, or you're a Palestinian, and they just, because one person got kidnapped, they just bombed you know, they just wiped out all of the power for hundreds of thousands of people, and that's going to last a few months. I mean, if you're on either side of that, it's extremely hard to not be emotional about it. And that's another place where I think America should should come in and and and, uh, and should be the honest broker and and get forceful in in kind of uh, steering people toward a solution. But this administration yeah. has shown no no and signs there, of doing yeah, that. And there are anymore. a lot of people now who who just say, oh, you know, not our problem anymore. Uh, that's a discouraging thing. Is a number of Americans who say, I'm sick of talking about this. Right, right. Because right. Uh, I just think it's a huge security problem for America. The lack of a two-state solution there, and and certainly that Al Qaeda thinks it is because Al Qaeda consistently says when they list. Their top two or three talking points uh, for terrorist recruiting, they list that one. Right. Um, and and so uh, it is depressing how many people are getting depressed. Yes. But you know, one other thing about about being optimistic and positive about uh, America, I think, uh, in terms of it's our relationship with the uh, Islamic world, um, we're a, a religious country, and we're we're, we're a country of people who who were, were raised to whatever degree going to church on Sundays, even if maybe we don't go every Sunday now. Uh, we, we, can, we can relate to this idea. Mm -hmm. Europe, Europe doesn't have as much That's of that true. anymore. Their churches are, are a lot emptier than our churches. So, I, I mean, I think one area of common ground between the United States specifically and the Islamic world is, is that we get the idea of being religious to a certain... I mean, you know... It, it, it a little bit depresses me when I hear that Jerry Falwell's opening a new church and it's bigger and better than the last one he had, which was already too big. But nevertheless, you know, we we understand this idea about faith and, and it having an important place in your life. Yeah. And and so you know that I, maybe that's something that we can hang on to. No, potentially that's an asset. I mean, it hasn't especially worked like that so far. I think the irony is that culturally and even politically. Muslims in America have a certain amount in common with evangelicals. I mean, if you, for example, ask yourself, what parts of a public school curriculum would they object to, right, as kind of crossing the bounds uh, toward secularism or salaciousness, they would probably agree on a lot of these things. Right. But, um, right. 
but it hasn't worked out that way. Evangelicals are, 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 are not, I don't think, maybe I'm wrong, making a lot of overtures no. toward American Muslims, which again would be conducive to American security, I think, if, if American Muslims felt, you know, integrated and welcomed in society. Although they're not nearly the, the, the problem in that regard that I think a lot of European Muslims are, uh, partly because their, 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 uh, their, their economic status is very different. We, we don't have so many poor Muslims. We have you know, middle-class, well-educated Muslims, and so on. But, but it is, uh, that's right. That is, in principle, an asset, the fact that America is a religious country. So there you have it. So there you have it. So we close on an upbeat note. Right. Um, and that's about it. Do you have any other plans for the 4th of July weekend, aside from painting and selling your house? So, selling your house, number one. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, organizing the uh, American Girl uh, toys in, in, the, in the kids' room. I think that, that'll be my goal. Well, that sounds like a worthwhile initiative. <laughs> there you go. Okay. All right. Well, happy 4th. Happy 4th. See ya. Bye.